Good morning, everyone. I'm Kathleen Drum, and I'm the Industry Director at TIFF, and it's my absolute pleasure to welcome you to Breakfast at TIFF, where today we'll be discussing sexual harassment in the Canadian screen industry. Thank you so much for taking out time and what we know are very busy lives to be here for this very important conversation. To begin, I'd like to take a moment to honour the original keepers of this land by acknowledging the Mississaugas of New Credit, the Haudenosaunee and the Huron-Wendat. We thank you so much for hosting us here today and for hosting TIFF year-round. I would also like to acknowledge and to thank our corporate sponsors and government supporters who make everything that TIFF does possible. On October 5th, when a group of women spoke out against Harvey Weinstein in an article in the New York Times, it proved a watershed moment. A stunning landslide of allegations was unleashed about some of, the, of entertainment's most dominant players. Powerful men have lost their lives from major stars to high-level film and television executives. The hashtag, Me, the hashtag MeToo movement quickly spread to other industries and shows no sign of abating. We all know that sexual harassment is a complex, challenging and highly, deeply personal subject. It's been around for millennia. There, there really is no quick fix. And we are all here to try to work out this together. We're not experts in the field, but we are determined to make a difference. The entire staff, I can tell you at TIFF, have been galvanised by this, this issue and we're working with industry partners and stakeholders to ensure our policies continue to evolve to meet the needs of our community. The people here on stage have come to represent their organisations or to offer their viewers filmmakers about real ways that we can move ahead to, to create a safer work environment for people in the industry. At the end of the session, our volunteers will hand out information on free legal advice available here in Toronto for victims of sexual assault. I want to thank lawyer Anna Mattis, who is here today, for providing this. So please do take it and share it with your colleagues and friends. Please, throughout the session, feel free to continue the conversation also using our um, hashtag breakfast at TIFF. I'd now like to welcome our moderator, who will introduce our panellists. Nicole Stamp is an actor and director. She has hosted and directed the Gemini award-winning show The Space for TV Ontario and acted in The Handmaid's Tale, Assassin's Creed, Origins and Camilla, a web series with over 60 million views on YouTube. Nicole is a board member of the Artist Mentoring Youth Project and the director of its E1 film program. Last month, Nicole wrote a Facebook essay, What Decent Men Can Do in Response to Hashtag Me Too, which went viral. It was shared 70,000 times and published by CNN. Nicole Stamp. Thank you so much, Kathleen. Good morning, everybody. Thank you all so much for being here. Um, and good morning, panel. Thank you for being here as well. Um, so I'd like to actually address something that Kathleen said. She said that none of us on the stage here are experts about sexual harassment. And professionally speaking, that's true. But thinking about it, I think, unfortunately, on a personal level, many of us on this stage and many of us in this room actually sort of are experts in sexual harassment by virtue of the fact that we live in this culture in which it's endemic and by virtue of the fact that as hashtag me too showed us, so many of us have our own personal experiences um, with this abuse of power. And so um, I think it's really valuable to have a conversation about it and I think that for people to share their stories of, of their me too experiences can be a deeply powerful and healing experience. But I also think that a, bar a barrage of lurid details um, can be sort of re-traumatizing and it can be sort of exhausting and overwhelming and I'm not always sure that that in and of itself is the best way to move us forward. So for today's conversation, um, I'm really interested in, in hearing from these industry leaders about how our industry is moving forward, not so much about you know some of the disgusting details of our past, but more about how we're going to address this culture and make change. Um, and sexual harassment is endemic to all industries. It happens in factories, it happens in finance. Um, and right now the world's spotlight is on our industry 
And I don't think that's a coincidence. I think people are watching us with extra attention because they care about us. Um, you know, you could tell me that a CEO in the automotive industry was abusive towards a colleague, and on an intellectual and abstract level, of course I know that's wrong and I disapprove of it. But when you tell me that same story about a person whose movies I've watched and cried with, a, a person whose performances have really touched me, a person who was my Thursday night dad growing up, I, <laughs> right? I feel that on a really visceral level. I feel a betrayal because I care about those people. So we in the film industry, I think, are in a really particular position where the world is watching us. They've invested in us because of the stories we've told. We've captured their hearts, which means that now we've also captured their attention. And I think that for us as an industry, we can actually probably afford to take a little bit of a step back and think, well, we have to clean house in our own industry, but we're sort of the first industry in which this level of um, detail is coming out about how pervasive this culture is. We're not the only industry in which this is happening. So the way that we handle this moment not only changes our industry, but I think also provides a template for other industries and for other people to make changes themselves. So the way that we deal with our abusers, once we've done that, and somebody that's as beloved as a, a television or film personality can be disgraced for abuse of power, that makes it a lot harder for that CEO at the automotive company to get away with what he's doing. It empowers everybody else to speak up too. So I think we're at a point where we can really take brave, constructive, transformative steps to change our culture, to change our reporting systems, to change the way we look at victims. And if we can do that, if we can sort of be the vanguard of this change, we can actually be affecting people's lives in industries that we barely are aware of in, in the years to come, if that makes sense. Um, so I think it's a really important conversation. Brava. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I think this is a really important conversation, and I'm so grateful that you've all come here to have it, and I'm so grateful that you're all here to listen to it. I'm really grateful to TIFF for hosting this conversation, um, and I think it's evident that the tide is changing, and frankly, I think it's about time. So um, just to let you know what to expect from this panel, um, I'm going to take a few minutes to introduce all of our guests. I'm going to read a bio for each of them, which doesn't always happen on a panel this big, but they're really good guests, and I want you to know what they've done. Um, so if you'll indulge me in that, I think, I think they're worth it. Um, if you have any, oh, after that, we'll have a moderated discussion with just the eight of us that will last for 50 minutes. And if you have any questions, please hold them to the end. We'll have about a 20-minute Q&A at the end. Um, and at 10.30, we'll head back out into the lobby where the breakfast snacks are. And uh, we can have a bit of a half an hour sort of mingle time. So if there's anything you'd really like to address at that point, that might be a good time to do it one-on-one -on -one as well. Um, if you have a cell phone, I would ask that you silence it. If you have a pager, I would ask that you relinquish your grip on the 90s and join us in the present. <laughs> Put it with your fax machine. <laughs> if you have a fax machine, I'd like to see it. Um, <laughs> and now please join me in welcoming our exceptional panel. So, I'm going to do them in the order I have written just because it's easier for me. So, Catherine Middleton, fittingly she's in the middle, oversees the Directors Guild of Canada's National Directors Division, Western Councils, and Director Rights Acquisitions Fees. As co-chief negotiator of the DGC CMPA Standard Agreement, she established the DGC CMPA Diversity Committee. On behalf of the Guild, Catherine has worked with, with CUES, Canadian Unions for Equality on Screen, Women in View, the Two Times More Initiative, and she just arrived in Ontario last night, so please welcome Catherine Middleton. Right here on my right is Marguerite Piggott. She's the Canadian Media Producers Association's Vice President of Outreach and Strategic Initiatives. Before joining the CMPA, she was Super Channel's Head of Creative Development and the Vice President of Development and Production for Odeon Films, for whom she executive produced several well-known titles. She's also been a programmer of Canadian feature films right here at TIFF. She's the Vice Chair of the OMDC and the Chair of the Governance Committee. Please welcome Marguerite Piggott. Two seats over, we have Teresa Tova, the president of Actra Toronto, where she previously held the position of vice president internal for 10 years. She also serves as treasurer of Actra National, and she's the chair of the Entertainment Industry Coalition. Tova sits on the board of the Creative Arts Savings and Credit Union, and one of her most important contributions to safety in the entertainment industry was the 2015 passage of Ontario's Protecting Child Performers Act. Welcome, Teresa Tova. And in spot number two here, we have Alex Herber. 
Alex is a partner in the Labor and Employment Law Group in Toronto. Her practice focuses on advising and representing employers in labor, employment, and human rights matters, and she has considerable experience in the retail, hospitality, and healthcare industries as well. Working closely with clients, she's actively involved in auditing and drafting workplace policies, as well as providing training for employees on issues such as harassment and discrimination. Happy to have you, Alex Herver. Thank you. Moving down the line, we have Melanie Chung. Melanie is a Toronto-based director. Her short films have screened around the world, and her latest short, Marie, was recently acquired by the CBC. As a commercial director, Chung is represented by Toronto's Radke Films, where her clients include Discover Card, Macy's, Bank of Montreal, Coca-Cola, and Nike. She co-directed the pilot episode of the award-winning web series, Millions, on which she also served as an executive producer. Thank you so much for joining us, Melanie Chung. Beside Melanie is Patricia Rosema, a film director, writer, and producer. She studied philosophy and English literature at Michigan's Calvin College, then worked as a broadcaster before embarking on a career as a director. Patricia co-wrote the screenplay for HBO's Grey Gardens, which was nominated for a Writers Guild of America Award and nominated for an Emmy Award for Outstanding Writing. Patricia's feature films include I've Heard the Mermaids Singing, When Night is Falling, Mansfield Park, Happy Days, and Into the Forest. She is no stranger to the TIFF stage. Thank you for being here, Patricia Rosema. And Martin Cates. Martin is a producer whose film credits include Hotel Rwanda, Spider, A Dangerous Method, Cosmopolis, and Maps to the Stars. His television projects include Spectacle and Ice Road Truckers. Martin holds law degrees from U of T and Le Université de Paris 1 Panthéon-Sorbonne. He's a member of the Law Society of Upper Canada, a director of the Institute for Canadian Citizenship, and chair of the Academy of, the, of Canadian Cinema and Television. Please welcome Martin Cates. Isn't that a great panel? Thank you all so much for being here. So I guess to start us off, I want to know, when the, when the flood of Me Too stories hit your social media in early October, I'd love to hear really briefly from each of you, what was your reaction when those stories started to come to the forefront from our industry? Did you feel like it was a surprise? Did you feel like it was a call to action? If you can just go down the line each, just so we get a sense of each of you and, and how it felt. Can we start with you, Marguerite? Sure. Um, certainly not a surprise. Um, as you've said, we're all uh, experts in, in, in some way, shape, or form uh, in this subject matter. Um, but um, as, as not, not, so not surprising, but devastating. Um, and I think what really mattered about that is that it, it caused you to say everything that you said just now and, and for it to be right and true which is that we are at a watershed moment of our own making. And it's a huge opportunity that I'm really grateful for. Thank you so much, Marguerite. Alex, how about you? I mean, I come from a different perspective being a lawyer. I've seen a slow increase of sexual harassment complaints since um, uh, Bill 132, which is our Ontario government put in sexual harassment into our occupational health and safety legislation. And so that has slowly seen people being more comfortable bringing forward complaints. But definitely, from an outside perspective, I think I was shocked at the severity of the uh, claims that came forward and had not realized that to that degree was still happening. So that was very unfortunate for me. Thank you. Teresa? I'm not a lawyer, but I play one on TV. <laughs> um, I'm going to give us some tips. That's afterwards. right. We're going <laughs> to compare notes. Um, I wasn't shocked as a Me Too, hashtag Me Too times five as an adult. Read between the lines. Um, I immediately uh, saw the cry for help and went, why have we not done this before? And immediately said, and we certainly can't do this alone. And immediately reached out to Q's and uh, our national industry partners and promised Mia Kirshner, who sat in my office, she was the first woman to come in and talk to us about it before her article in the Globe and Mail. And said, you know what? I need to bring the industry together. Let's do this. Let's get this done. Now I understand why I'm president of ACTRA. Great. Thank you. Catherine? I think... For me personally, uh, as, a, as a woman um, and as someone who has worked on set and for the Directors Guild for more than 30 years, mm -hmm. and as the mother of a young adult woman who's now working in the industry, I think it felt like a collision. And then there was this reeling from this collision. And with more of these brave people, uh, women and men who came forward, and now with the very public consequences that we're seeing, I, there's this incredible 
forward momentum that I'm really proud to be a part of. Thank you so much. Melanie? For me personally, it, it kind of felt more like a relief. Uh, it was kind of like this floodgates of, of this ugliness that's being opened up and not these secrets that we have to carry anymore. So for me, the hashtag Me Too, it's, uh, to me what it showed me is like how not alone we are in these experiences, which to me is very important and, and at the same time of how pandemic it is, which is also really saddening at the same time. But for me, it was just kind of like, yes, we finally get to talk about it and talk openly about it, which was something that I felt like was a weight being lifted. Yeah, thank you. I think actually that was part of the genesis of the Me Too story. If you've had, even anyone's heard the interview with Tarana Burke, who's the activist who came up with the idea mm -hmm. about 10 years before Alyssa Milana tweeted it in October, she had an experience where she was working in a summer camp and a child started telling her a really difficult story about sexual assault and um, Tarana's response was she, she just froze and panicked and she told the child, uh, go to somebody else, go to this person, they can help you. And she said the look on the child's face was so betrayed and that what she had really wanted to say was me too, the same thing happened to me, but she was just so triggered by it that she wasn't able to get that out. So yeah, I think you're really right that the power of us being able to share our stories and recognize that this was not a personality flaw that ha caused this to happen to you, this is systemic, I think is really powerful. Thanks for mentioning that. Yeah, Patricia? Um, I was thrilled, actually. I felt like this is a moment of uh, healing for our collective gender consciousness. Um, and it, it's so important to speak about trauma and that the trauma could be discussed without each person being re-traumatized was a brilliant um, set of circumstances. And uh, an acknowledgement about how normalized this kind of um, experience had become in our business. I knew Harvey quite well and I saw how it just was worked around and thrilled that this no longer, well, one hopes, depending on how we handle it from this point forward can be, um, can be curtailed in the short term and maybe eradicated in the long term. Thank you so much, Martin. So I, I'll apologize because I'm not an expert, um, but I've been in the industry for 30 years. And I think um, that the, identi the identification of this issue as one which has interfered with and destroyed the careers of so many promising people in our industry is a great loss obviously for those people as individuals, most of whom are women, and a great loss for our industry as well. And so without looking back and trying to decide how to address and punish those issues, the, the question I think for us in the industry is how do we make sure that doesn't happen again and that doesn't keep happening? Thank you so much. Thanks. Now, I've heard some news reporting that's personally made my blood boil a little bit, where people have acted like the definition of sexual harassment or sexual assault is open for debate. Perhaps it should be crowdsourced, and we should ask people on the street, do you know what sexual harassment is? And the thing is, we do know what sexual harassment is. There's a legal definition. Now, Alex, just to get us all on the same page to start, could you give us the legal definitions? I mean, the, the definition of sexual harassment is um, that it's an unwelcome conduct of a vexatious nature. Obviously, vexatious is annoying, disturbing, humiliating, demeaning. And uh, that is unwelcome. And that is the uh, most important part of the definition is that the person receiving that conduct does not welcome it. The important thing also to realize from, from anyone's perspective is that the intent of the action under our legislation doesn't matter. So you know, being involved in so many sexual harassment investigations, I often hear from alleged harassers that they didn't mean certain conduct. And what's important in our legal system is that whether you intended the conduct or not, the fact that it is unwelcome is what is at issue. Mm. Thank you so much. So Tova, a week ago, ACTRA hosted a round table where representatives from the industry, including some people that are on the stage, met to discuss the State of the Union. Yeah. Um, from that meeting, can you talk about what came out of it and what you found industry members were expressing the most concern about? There was, a, there was a big spotlight on us that day. There was a lot of press downstairs, wasn't there? And there was a big pressure on all of us to come to the table ready to work. And that's what I was so impressed by, this, these industry stakeholders. Uh, we gave everybody homework uh, to talk to their members, to listen to their members, find out what the gaps were, number one, uh, what, their, what their issues were in their individual work spaces, and then what solutions were going forward. And I was buoyed, we were strengthened hearing, seeing those reports that came the, a few days before that we could read. It's like we were reading each other's uh, narratives. Everyone was on the same page. We all understood that 
fear of reprisal was number one. Definition of the workplace was number two. Expanding that and taking full, full responsibility and that we couldn't do it alone. So um, I think we, only time we really argued was when we encouraged each other to be more courageous, to be bolder and to take actions. The, it, we needed to do this and I applaud every single, there was 50 people in that room, 16 organizations and we stayed an extra hour and a half to get that shit done, you know? And we came out with an action plan and we have three working groups that are starting to plan when they're gonna get together this week already, it's in my calendar already, to talk about the four action items that we put on the plate. What were those? So they were industry-wide code of conduct, industry-wide. Right? So we're not all in our own silos protecting you know, this part of the labor code or that part of, you know, we need to work together, clearly defining actions uh, that are acceptable, behaviors that are acceptable, not acceptable, and consequences, number one working group. Safer reporting mechanisms, maybe using the new tools that are out there uh, with high tech, maybe Callista, maybe escrow, maybe I, all, but recognizing that putting the, responsibility on the shoulders of any one victim or survivor is not fair. We need um, an anonymous portal as well. And we still need to be able to do something. You don't just say, well, nobody came forward. We know, but they wouldn't charge, wouldn't go forward. We still can do something. And hearing the, the members around the table talk about thinking outside the box, how they did that was amazing. Uh, more effective enforcement of our existing policies, which actually, we been working on this for decades, a lot of us, and certainly lately as well, improving our policies. Um, but they've been in place, they just haven't been used as much as they should have been. And then the fourth, and this is so important, a comprehensive educational initiative. We're hearing that it starts in high school. It starts in coaching classes of young actors. And what we're teaching, what it, it, it starts back then. And a, a preemptive, preventative education policy, but also a restorative justice. Let's help these predators, if it's just verbal abuse, become better human beings. If it's sexual assault, well, of course, you, you don't get a out of jail card. So those are the, the, the four areas that we're concentrating on going forward. Thank you so much. One of the first things you mentioned was that a lot of people had uh, brought up a fear of reprisal, so that if they were to report or blow the whistle on somebody, yeah. that they would experience penalties for that. Maybe um, Patricia and Melanie, as two people who spend a lot of time on sets, Martin, you as well, have you observed that? Have you seen people being you know, um, socially penalized or had their careers held back because they've spoken up or raised problematic issues? Well, I've fortunately been on sets where I'm the director. <laughs> so, you know, I am, I'm in a lucky position in that um, I have the capacity to, to um, oversee. And, and I try to create an environment where it's less likely to happen. What's happened beyond my, you know, field of vision, um, I haven't been able to control. But, like, there's, there's always the victim blaming. And I think our, there are impulses to do that are many, f like the reasons behind that are manifold. One is just a wish to self-protect. If we can blame them, then we don't have to have it happen to us. If we can say, oh, well, she did this, she wore that, she said this, she was in this place. If I don't do X, Y, and Z, then I'm safe. Mm -hmm. So it's a real simple, immediate, we do it with like cancer. We say, well, she was angry a lot. You know, like whatever. So we, we do it with like cells dividing. So why wouldn't we do it with something more murky and, you know, confusing than, um, the, uh, than sexuality? But um, the other thing is just, it's an extension of the patriarchy to blame the victim. It's to all, ter I'm sorry, there are lots of lovely men in the world, but it's to all men's advantage if women are afraid because they run into their arms and they're safe. And they, you know, it's to, so there's a, uh, and then there's, there's just inertia of change. You know, the power system is set up and it's the devil we know and people don't want to change. So blame the victim, then we don't have to blame all the, p the people in power and we don't have to have massive, massive social change. Yeah. Um, so anyway, yeah, that's, a, that's a very sort of abstract answer to a specific question. Um, I'm glad you raised those issues because I think they're at the heart of what we're actually talking about here. So thank you. Melanie, have you seen anything firsthand? Uh, I mean, for me, I, reprisals always kind of felt very multi-layered. Um, I've worked like all sorts of different 
different jobs within the film industry. So for me, I never saw specifically like X happens and then Y happens. But uh, for I've always just seen like a reaction to the environment and one is always women just up and leave and completely change careers, do something else because the, the environment is just too toxic or it's kind of like the adverse uh, or the complete opposite reaction, which is they go into survival mode, and then they're just like, "Oh, I, I'm the tough girl. I can, you know, I can handle it. It's just a joke. I can." And and in a way, it kind of breeds more more of this uh, this enabling of, of men. And uh, I'm not trying to victim blame, but but I've seen it. I've done it myself too, where I'm like, "Oh, it's fine. You know, it's it's fine. I can it's handle fine. it." But at the same time, you know, it's it's not making change. You know, so. It's, it's something that we just do to protect ourselves, you know, and it's immediate reaction to just kind of go into the defense mode. So. Can I just ju jump in and say, everybody should read Nicole's piece. It's unbelievable. Yeah, and it really starts cool. with, learn to use the, f the term, not cool. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> just say it, Thank you know, you so just much. say not cool. Like, and it's a whole list of brilliant kind of strategies to deal with this, but yeah, yeah. And very good. Martin, did you have anything you want to add? Yeah, well, um, so I haven't seen instances of sexual harassment specifically on my sets over the last 30 years that I've worked for. Maybe that's my fault. Maybe I didn't notice them. Maybe people aren't coming to me because I'm a guy, and they don't think I'll deal with it, and so they're going elsewhere, or they're not dealing with it. But I will say this, that I've worked with a lot of strong directors who, who are women and a lot of strong directors who are men. And the strong directors who are men, when they tell the crew what they want, the crew nods and goes, wow, this guy really knows what he's doing. Let's do this. And when a strong woman director tells them what she wants, they tend to say, they tend to roll their eyes and seem to think, wow, she actually doesn't really know what she's doing. This is ludicrous what she's saying. Uh, she'll learn the that about halfway. The men are rolling their eyes, though. What's that? The men are rolling I'm, their eyes. I'm yeah. talking about the crews, which are overwhelmingly male, are rolling their eyes and thinking, uh, she clearly has no idea. We'll give her half a day. Yeah. She'll come around to figuring out that we know how to do this better than she does, and then we'll get on with our with our lives. And in most of those cases, I will say that half a day through, those crews have come around to accept that that strong woman director actually has a brilliant idea, mm -hmm. and they've been converted. But it's taken us half a day to get there. Yeah, and how much labor has it and taken that director no, it's, to, it's to corral horrifying. that crew for that half a yeah, day? How horrifying. much more work could have been done? And that's clearly the obverse of the same problem. Yeah, yeah thank you. Can I just say it took 20 years Sorry. and half a day. Yes. <laughs> yeah. 20 years and half a day, thank you. And Nicole, I would just say that under all the legal frameworks, reprisal and retaliation is prohibited under our law. So uh, most policies and codes of conduct will have specific language saying that people who bring forward complaints cannot be subject to rep reprisal or retaliation. How do you police that? But the reality Boy, is. you can. But the reality is we're independent contractors. We have very, very short employment most of us. Uh, a few days here to a few weeks, and if you are lucky enough to get that job on that crew or as an actor, you're not gonna be a troublemaker, and that's the problem we have. There's not a culture of saying, you can go to your key makeup gal and say, I was just harassed, and you're gonna be kept on. You're gonna be gotten rid of. That's the perception. There's a term for it in casting called PETA. They actually write on your sheet, pain in the ass. If you cause trouble, you're gone. Mm -hmm. That's what our problem is. So when you say you haven't heard of it, I respect you and I know that's true, but uh, I've talked to 70 plus women myself in the last three weeks. Many of them are journalists, makeup gals, wardrobe gals, grips, men and women who are calling me because I've said, we've got a lawyer, we've got some advice for you, <laughs> we've got a specialist, and these are not things they've brought to the other guilds and unions or to us. Mm -hmm. So we have, go up, have yeah, please. It is the, the freelance nature of our industry. Yeah. It, there is insecurity inherent mm -hmm. in yeah. the jobs that all of our members do. And so the fear of not being able to secure the next job or even the situation that we find ourselves in with this freelance industry where the producers or the employers who we rely on to provide a safe work environment um, are, are, could be gone, uh, many of them, after the last day of post. Their numbered company doesn't exist anymore. And so these are, this is a serious concern. Can I just say, uh, 
here's why I think there's a, an opportunity for us. When you talked about the watershed moment, I mean, I do think it's a watershed moment. And whether it was Weinstein or whether it was Gomeshi, I mean, if you look back and you say, you know, Gomeshi was in this situation he was in, I assume, because for years, someone said, we can't get rid of him, he's the whole show. And not only is he the whole show, he's the most listened to show on the network, therefore he's the network. And then, in very short order, he was gone. You know, Matt Lauer is gone, Harvey Weinstein is gone, Kevin Spacey is gone. You know, what's happened quite significantly is that all the people who have always said, I can't do anything about my complaint because they'll never listen to me because it's, it's Jeffrey Tambor or it's, you know, they're the whole show and I'm not the show. That seems to have ended. Now, I'm not saying it's ended definitively forever, but this is the first time in history that we can look back and say, look, all those people ran banks that destroyed the economy, they still have jobs. Like, you know, that didn't, they didn't lose their jobs. But people are losing their jobs, companies are disappearing instantly, and that's the watershed <laughs> moment where we can maybe say, actually, it's not the grip who's going to lose their job. It might actually be the actor or the director or the producer and the show might actually go down. And so the fear of reprisal might be shifting to the other side. This is the watershed moment that we need to take advantage of mm -hmm. and, and try and shift the entire culture that way. Yeah, I read a really great tweet that then became an article called, um, <laughs> instead of mourning the art we've lost because of shitty men, <laughs> let's mourn all the art we never got to see because of women who left the industry because of shitty men. True, well, true. we're in the company of an extraordinarily talented person here in Sarah Pauly, who wrote a beautiful piece in the uh, New York Times recently and just talked about actually abandoning acting primarily in that moment because she just didn't want to deal with it. She knew what it was going to look like and didn't want to deal with it. And we lost that. We lost years of that. We gained years of other talents. But, you know, I do think we should shift the focus from all the monsters and look at these beautiful young women who have so are drawn to this unbelievably powerful and poetic medium that we have. And they're made to feel like the walking sex organs and, you know, and won't deal with it. Just can't deal with it and leave. Yeah. But someone mentioned cues earlier, and that work has been going on for a number of years now, five, six years, two studies on gender inequality and actually causing institutional change. The Two Times More campaign, the telefilm funding, where they're actually looking for women-led productions, and they were surprised at the increase just in six months of valuable, top-notch projects <laughs> that, that, that they funded now. So we have to just keep pushing that envelope. Yes. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Sarah, I didn't know you were here. Thank you so much for the piece that you wrote. It was so powerful and so useful, and for, for the work that you've done, it's really, it's great to have you. Um, so I wanna talk, I go back a little bit to discussing the reporting process, because I think it's a really complicated, I've had things happen to me and thought, am I ready for a court case? I might not be ready to report this. Um, so can we talk a little bit about how, from the guilds, from Tova and from Catherine and from Marguerite, if a person experiences sexual misconduct in a workplace that's, and, and it falls under your jurisdiction, um, how is the reporting process? What are you doing to improve it and to support the victims? Um, so what we're doing going forward at this point is, you know, based on the work that has come out of the um, pan-industrial meeting that we had last week, is we're exploring all kinds of, pardon me, <coughs> um, all kinds of options for a, a process that includes safe reporting, mm -hmm. adjudication of claims so that people feel listened to, because a huge issue is that people have reported and haven't felt listened to, sure. and consequences. Um, because if there isn't a clear set of consequences, then there's not a deterrent. Um, so we're exploring models to put that together. And in terms of, you know, uh, what tools exist now uh, for reporting, those tools relate to the collective agreements, they relate to the human rights code, they relate to labor law. And so, Alex, I know you can provide yeah. insight on, on the human rights code and labor law. Sure. I mean, I can tell you that um, different policies have different mechanisms to resolve issues around uh, claims of sexual harassment, and it's important that people know that those policies are there. And I always say to my clients, they need to be living, breathing policies. They cannot just be words on a paper that people don't feel they can access. And that certainly can be a very important way to deal with different levels of sexual harassment. 
Um, obviously, we have a human rights code, and that provides for an administrative process where you can bring a complaint to the Human Rights Tribunal of Ontario and can have that claim dealt with through that process. The great thing about that process is that you don't have to pay legal costs for it, and you can have your process supported with a lot of support from the administration. There's also Legal Aid Ontario provides support through the Human Rights Legal Support Centre that can provide assistance to individuals who've brought forward claims of harassment. So there are definitely avenues like that, and those avenues are quicker generally than going through the civil courts, which can be a lengthy and of, often very strenuous process. Human rights tribunals try to get everything from beginning to end done in a year. So wow. sounds long <laughs> for most of you, but for me being a lawyer, that's actually a quick process. And um, it's definitely a process that people can access in a much more affordable and efficient way. So now, but, oh, sorry. sorry. So, so what we're doing at the union is we've looked at our, our uh, complaint processes our, and, and we're expediting them. First of all, our discipline processes. Uh, it's not good enough to say it's a year, <laughs> bless you, darling. Well, that's through the Human Rights but, Tribunal. <laughs> you know, I hear you, I hear you, I hear you. So within our internal processes, when we're negotiating with producers or this or that, we want expedited processes. We're throwing into the mix now that we're going to investigate and get things happening within 48 hours. Oh, wow. And what we're, yes, absolutely, uh, especially on that spectrum, you have to prioritize, right? The ones that are serious, absolutely, within 48 hours. The ones that are bully, you know, words I, might take a little longer. Um, we're trying, we've uh, uh, created an ad hoc sexual harassment committee made up of 70 plus of these women who've come forward to talk to us, women who've actually uh, lived this reality and they are our litmus test. Met with them twice already so that they, our members, our experts, are involved in the policies we're putting forward. And we've also um, g taken our after hours emergency hotline and rebranded it and plastering it everywhere and that's becoming our sexual harassment and emergency hotline, which is answered by a counselor and um, and you get immediate, immediate reaction. And we've talked to our service providers about offering PTSD, counseling, whatever that needs for victims of this kind of harassment. So actual active things right now. What we can do now, we've met with our industry, local partners, guilds and unions, and we've got an action plan, and we're gonna announce those every single week. It's a living document. I love what you said, Marie, <laughs> that what we can get done now, we get done now. Then there's medium term things that we have to investigate a little more. Then there's the long term things which we will bring government in with us to actually change effective legislation because they're on side with us. They want us to, they want to help. That's great. Thank you. And actually pushing for a really short timeline like that. I, I heard a story this week that I thought really sort of brought home the need for that. It's a pretty well known Canadian actress who worked on a film and she said that she signed on to do this film. It had a very, I, I have her permission to share this story by the way. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> it had a very vulnerable sex scene in it that she had agreed to do with based on the information that she knew while in rehearsals, the director sexually assaulted her and she was not able to get a report in motion quickly enough. There wasn't a quick enough response in place so that a couple of days later, she ends up on set with this director doing this you know, partially unclothed, very vulnerable scene. Who, this person who has assaulted her now gets to see her in this position all day long. And it was really difficult for her. She said she can't even watch the movie and she's kind of embarrassed that it exists. Um, and I think that being able to have something that gets, where a counselor can give you advice right in the moment and where somebody from actor can get back to an actor in that kind of situation quickly is so crucial. So thank you for that. Yeah, and I, I, I just want to add to that. Um, you know, when I, uh, we talked about the pan-industrial approach that we're taking for the, the big mechanism for reporting, mm -hmm. for um, adjudication, for consequences, that's really important. But it's also important that producers obviously be equipped to, to react very, very quickly mm -hmm. to all of this. So at CMPA, we're working very, very fast to provide them with those tools. So um, we're already meeting with consultants and building these tools with consultants um, to help our members to understand, you know, what is sexual assault? Um, how do you empower your employees to talk about it? What are bystander obligations? Uh, what is a process for immediate reporting? Um, you know, all of that stuff that's required. We're, we're putting together a handbook for that. And we're also gonna be doing um, in-person training um, webcasts, webinars, recorded training. Our members pay for all of the professional development that we do, so we tend to deliver it specifically to our members. But because what we're really talking about here is cultural shift, we don't accomplish a cultural shift unless it includes absolutely everybody. 
So uh, we will be making all of these tools, all of the recorded webinars, all the tools that we're building for producer members um, available to any producer who wants to access them on our website so that we hope that that knowledge uh, will, will suffuse the entire industry. And we're also going to be reaching out to schools and offering it to, this, you know, to the CFC or the NSI or whatever. We've yet to determine those partners. But again, what we're looking at here is a cultural shift. And so we've got to look at that next generation. And in terms of a longer term view, what we really need to accomplish, I, I think you know, the best solution to this problem is gender balance. And so that's something that on a longer term basis, we're very, very active on that file. So we're part of the Telefilm Working Group that got to 50-50 by 2020. Um, we're working closely with Women in View on Two Times More and uh, Five in Focus. And there's much more we're doing besides, in terms of internally, our own board of directors, changes we've made there, et cetera, um, to achieve gender balance. Because once you, you know, Patricia mentioned, uh, people don't necessarily want to argue with the person in power. Well, fine, then let's look at who's in power. And let's be more creative about that. Let's, let's make sure that the people in power are women and are diverse people, because that's how you change culture. Women have typically been harassed because they are in a position of diminished power. That's true for groups that are regarded as diverse as well. And so those are the groups that we really need to look at in terms of let's change the power dynamic, let's develop the power dynamic so that there, yeah, there are more voices, more people in power, because that automatically makes it a safe space. Patricia, you talked about you know, it, 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 you try to construct a set where that kind of thing doesn't happen. And that's because you can, and because it's top of mind for you. Mm -hmm. um, and so we need more people doing what you're doing and what Sarah's doing, what Melanie's doing on set every day. And producers, for us, um, you know, sure, there are problems in production for sure when people are on set, actors, directors, et cetera. But production offices are open 365 days a year. And so we've got to think about it in two ways, in terms of what happens on set, but also what happens in production offices. And the idea of the extended workplaces is a very important one, especially when you're on location. But even here, we're about to go into Christmas party season. Uh, and I have a, like a knot in the pit of my stomach as I think about it. Um, that's extended workplace. Um, be nice, everybody. <laughs> Is there any legal That's jurisdiction for those extended workplaces, Alex? I mean, there was a decision back in 2001 in the Ontario Court of Appeal where a senior executive had people to his cottage in the hot tub and things did not go well there. And certain people made complaints of sexual harassment and this person with 20 years of service lost his job and was terminated for cause. And the whole discussion was around, his view was that you know this was outside the scope of performing duties, it was a social activity, and therefore he was not required to adhere to certain standards. And the Ontario Court of Appeal said absolutely not. This is okay. an extended, this is part of the workplace, the social activity derives from your connection to the workplace, so you cannot just fabricate, you know, that it has to be within four walls to be a workplace, so I'm totally That's in agreement a lovely. with that. Yeah. That's a lovely outcome and rare. It, it was rare. And Very rare, and yeah. it's mostly the women who are discredited, yeah. their sexual history brought up there, and their unfortunately there's something profoundly wrong with our justice system. It's throw everything at them, see what sticks. And I think we have to have a situation where if a lawyer is defending someone they know is, you know, guilty, that 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 they should be called on that. I think there's something we're 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 condoning lying in this system right now, and it's it's it doesn't work for the disenfranchised, doesn't work for the powerless. Yeah. Um, so you know, like, what are the statistics on how many uh, sexual assault or sexual harassment? The distinction is important, by the way. I think we're mixing it together sometimes. Yeah, I would but, definitely. Keep but that the sexual ha harassment or sexual assault, what are the, what are the statistics on how many of those accusations stick? That's, Patricia, that's a really important question. And I think that's one of the reasons why we have to really work carefully, and CMP is leading this working group, on finding that mechanism for safe reporting, for adjudication, for consequences within the industry, um, for sexual harassment. Anything that belongs about in the, the criminal law of the code. land, though, not just um, I, in our I know. Guilds. No, I totally get that. But right now, we're looking at a conviction rate that is something like, I th it's 3% yeah. is what very I read. Low. I mean, the process. And, very few and so report. I just kind of think, yeah. all right. Y you guys get your house together, <laughs> and we're going to get busy over here, and 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 we'll do you know to the fullest extent of what we can um, within our authority. I'd like to draw all of your attention to an article that I thought was really enlightening. Um, 
you know, a lot of people say, well, like, there's a climate of false allegations, and we have to protect the people where these accusations are leveled against them, and what if it's, what if it didn't happen? What if she's a, whatever? Um, so there's an article on a site called Quartz Media. Uh, it's written by Sandra Newman, who's a writer for The Guardian, and the article title is, What Kind of Person Makes False Rape Allegations? And I highly recommend that everybody, if you have a second later on today, look it up and read it, because she talks about um, she sort of breaks down a number of false rape allegations and finds that when you look at actual rape victims, they're a completely disparate group. They're all different races, all different ages, um, all different kinds of personal backgrounds. When you look at people who have been proven to have made false rape allegations, like major patterns emerge in those stories. One of the big patterns that emerges is that the person who's leveling the false allegation is doing it because they have something to gain by being seen as a victim in this situation. And because they have to, because they have this goal in mind, they tend to not leave any room for ambiguity in their stories. So if you look at the case with Roy Moore, the actual allegations against Roy Moore were, um, he kissed me, he took me to an abandoned house and we took off our clothes but nothing else happened, right? They're pretty, they're, I mean, they're inappropriate because of the age of the person, but the actual actions that happened are like relatively tame on our sort of, you know, they're sort of PG rated. If you look at the false allegation that came forward towards that journalist uh, recently, it was, he raped me and I got pregnant and he forced me to have an abortion, right? She's leaving no room for ambiguity. There's no room to say, well, he, you know, that wasn't so bad. She's, pick she's making the most like colorfully terrible story she can. False allegations tend to fit that profile more than they tend to fit the, well, it was a Christmas party and this thing happened. There's no room for ambiguity. And the people that make false allegations have a previous history of making, you know, ridiculous claims to the police or have a previous history of, of fraudulent crime because a false allegation is a fraudulent crime. So it's like actually when a false allegation is, is made, it's actually like almost quite obvious that it's false in many cases and they're not nuanced. So the kind of nuanced stories that we're hearing where there's room for you to say, well, are you sure you didn't misinterpret something? That's kind of a sign that it's true because wouldn't you make up a better story if you were trying to <laughs> grind an ax? So I think like, I really encourage everyone to read that. I, I want our entire culture to just stop worrying about the false allegations because there are so few of them. And in fact, what happens instead is that women protect people that assaulted them. I myself have been assaulted by several people whose names I have not disclosed to anybody because I just am like, I'm not, you know what I mean? For all those reasons, I, what I'm not doing is going out and trying to make myself into a crusader for these people because I have shit to do, right? That's just not on the top of my list right now. Alex, do you have anything to say to that, or Teresa? I mean, I can say I've been practicing for 17 years. I have never had a false allegation in one of my investigations. Um, you know, sometimes there's a misinterpretation about certain conduct and, and comments, and people have different views of how close the relationship may have been. And sometimes it's really about correcting the behavior, but making intentionally false allegations is a rare occurrence. And typically speaking, there may be mental health issues or other issues that may be compounding why someone would bring forward a complaint of that nature. So I think part of the healing that we're in the middle of is that w w complainants need to be listened to and they need to be believed. <laughs> and so the process we're going through at the union uh, at ACTRA right now with our special advisor and myself and our staff is listening to dozens and dozens, you know. Um, and some of the cases are really about their personal lives. They just want it to stop. It's not about our workplace, some of them that are coming, but they, they have an opportunity right now to speak and have somebody actually respect their pain, and that's part of the healing. I just want to address one other little thing. We were talking about women, and I agree, it's women. It's mostly women. But I've had f four or five men now call us, and they all want to be anonymous, but they are talking about theater, an extension of our workplace, and the directors who are grabbing them and abusing them and the agents who are saying it, well, you'd be better off if you were gay you know and and they want to stay anonymous because there's this I don't know there's this pride of a guy has to be tougher or something and can't really come forward but they want it to be useful to us just another perspective so we can't leave that out of the equation either uh, theaters are have we've known historically, you know, the heads of <laughs> major festivals who've all, you know, had their young boys every season and everybody said, oh, that's the way they are, right? It's been part of the trade-off for work. It has to stop. Yeah, and, and I think uh, knowledge is power and we have to focus on education. That's one of the um, areas where Kendry Upton, who's also the executive director of the Directors Guild in BC, is heading up that working group for our stakeholders. And even in 
educating our members uh, so that they are aware that there are provisions in our collective agreement that outline the steps that you take when you are in a situation where you feel that you have been harassed. And we have that jointly negotiated with the Producers Association. So those rules are, are there in place. But you know, it, it doesn't matter even if those rules are there. If people don't have confidence in the results that will come out of it, it, it's useless. Yeah. So that's the area that we have to move forward and focus on, education, training, and empowering people who feel they're powerless. Yeah. Because sexual assault is typically about power more than, much more than it's about sex, given that you, Catherine, and you, Marguerite, representing producers and directors, you're representing people who on the pyramid of a film set are quite high up in that hierarchy. So you're often representing the person in power who may be inappropriately enacting that power um, and leveraging against people who are lower on in the pyramid who will not be necessarily members of your union. Do you feel like there's any conflict in terms of if one of your, if one of your representative, or uh, members rather acts badly towards a member of another union like Actor, Actra or IATSE or something, how do you justify protecting your own member, which is obviously one of your jobs, but also protecting the person that's been victimized by your member who may not be under your jurisdiction at all? How does that work? It, um, I'd like to have a little chat about power first. Um, because I think that, um, you know, one of the things in the Me Too campaign, um, a lot of my Facebook friends are producers. And so many of them had hashtag Me Too. And it had been, you know, as Mar Marty's saying, you know, the, the grips aren't, li or whoever, you know, they're not listening to the woman director and all of that. that that's a pervasive attitude. And what I'm hearing from a lot of women producers is they have been subject to behavior they shouldn't have been subject to from people in their employ. Yeah. Also, for myself, as an ex when I was an executive at Alliance Atlantis, and it was my job to acquire Canadian feature films at the script stage, someone was coming in to pitch me a film. And so I had all the power in the room, all of it. He had none. <laughs> and yet he was wildly inappropriate. And I was like, wow, I just learned something about power. I thought I had it all, but I don't because gender is power. And I hadn't made that calculus. So I think to, um, to think that directors and producers have all the power is actually, I would, I would take issue with that for starters. Mm -hmm. I think what we're looking at when we look at the issue of harassment and sexual harassment, we're looking at something that is pervasive mm -hmm. throughout the industry in terms of perpetrators and victims because it's pervasive throughout our society in terms of perpetrators and victims. So that's my little chat about power. So yeah. anytime. Um, uh, <laughs> like, try to stop me. Um, <laughs> but uh, then secondly, let's talk about protecting members. Um, first of all, one thing that was brilliant to see um, from the meeting that, that we had last week was we are 100% we are on the same page. There is zero conflict because there is zero tolerance. That's what we said in our joint statement. We are all on the same page, zero tolerance. So if a member of any one of our organizations is accused, we have, let's do the math. Um, if that one member is accused, I can place the, all my emphasis on that member and protecting that member, or I can place all my emphasis on protecting my entire membership and all those people. So we've seen people like Harvey Weinstein getting kicked out of the academy and something like that. That's the executives protecting their membership. So, you know, CMPA is adopting, we're in the process of adopting a code of conduct for our members. We do currently have mechanisms for uh, suspending or terminating membership, but they're not worded very uh, specifically. And so we're improving the wording on that. So we are looking at processes for suspending membership, for terminating membership, because we need to ensure that the CMPA in and of itself and membership in our organization is an imprimatur that connotes that you are dealing with a producer of quality. Um, so, so that's the point that we would take on that. But then again, going back to the culture shift, you don't get to accomplish a culture shift unless you bring everybody along with you, everyone. And some people aren't going to come if they don't feel that the process for adjudicating claims is transparent and just. If they don't feel like if they are accused, they will have due process. So we need to make sure that there is due process and that it is clear and that it is transparent. 
because then everybody knows what it is and everybody comes along for the ride. And if, when that due process is applied, someone's behavior is found to be outside of the bounds that our industry and our industry-wide code of conduct has set for itself, then we will protect our membership. And our industry. Yeah. And our industry. The insurance folk are going to want to insure Canadian films because we're going to set the standards. We're not going to lose work. We're going to gain it because you know when you come to Canada under this guideline <laughs> and this code of conduct that your sets won't be breaking down like House of Cards and you know and you won't have to replace your lead because they've known to be a recidivist learned that word right <laughs> good point yeah thank you I mean it actually is progressive I mean we can lead the charge here yeah sure Catherine we represent directors, but we also represent um, all of the departments that support the director. We also represent the the first entry level position into the industry, and so we have um, responsibilities to all of our members. And I think that in addition to the language that's in our contract, in our collective agreements, where, uh, again, the, the employer has the response, and in this case, the producer has responsibility for that safety on set. But um, it is a freelance industry, and so we can't just rely on that. We have to be a part of that. And as Marguerite said, there was this, in this unprecedented event, this meeting that happened seems like a month ago, but it was just, it was literally a week ago that all of these people in the room and there was absolutely no question that there would be zero tolerance for this. And as Marty said, you know, now the, the, the tail isn't going to be wagging the dog anymore. We're having all of these public consequences that seeing every day that um, no one is, everyone is taking this seriously and there isn't any tolerance of these kinds of actions. But what we want to do in the Guild is that we're appointing an outside auditor. We want to hand someone that can explore handling complaints in a, in a, with a third party, um, that can um, assist us in developing institutions that are equipped to handling reporting and investigations uh, better, that in, better than individual companies can. And the process has to be, as you said, it has to be fair, and it has to be transparent, and it has to be effective, and it has to be lasting. Thank you so much. That's great. So before we move on to our Q&A, I want to ask one more question just to wrap us up. Um, there was a Harvard Business Review article. This touches on something you said, Marguerite. Um, the title is, Harassment Training and Better Reporting Systems Won't End Sexual Harassment, But Promoting More Women Will. Do you believe that gender parity and more diversity in leadership is actually the answer that we need right now? Yeah. 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 <laughs> I, I believe that's sort of this miracle of our species that we come, that 50% are male and 50% are female. And um, <laughs> and it's, so simple. I, it's so so spectacular that we, anyway, I, I find it fascinating. But, but I do think that our enterprises work well when they're balanced that way. I really think that there's something beautiful about that, that balance. And I do believe that too many men in power is the problem. They start, you know, ignoring the uh, <laughs> the women around them and being proud of their ability to dominate them, and that's not healthy. It's not good. Just, I mean, forgive me for bringing up a kind. I couldn't of agree more. Okay. I'm just going to interrupt you there for a second <laughs> and restate what you just now. Um, <laughs> but there's a funny, icky thing. Forgive me, but. So many of these stories involve men displaying themselves. Simple code of conduct. Don't and put masturbating in front of women when try to imagine the reverse. <laughs> try to imagine it. It's just not feasible, like possible. And that no woman I've ever, that doesn't enter in. So anyway, so we have to limit their control of the, of the world. And it, the, the shift is slow and it's glacial. But, you know, we, this is a moment. This is a moment. This is a moment. We can take it. And don't blame the victims because we're going to slew of court cases now. And women are going to be wearing it. Yeah. Yeah. So quickly, we, I want to go down the, sorry to interrupt. I want to quickly go down the line and for each of you to just say, what's happening right now? What trends do you see in the industry that are making you feel positive and hopeful towards the future? Patricia, I think you just nailed a good one. Martin, did you have something? Well, I'll say that yeah, part of my time I spend at the Institute for Canadian Citizenship, which is an uh, organization that we founded 10 years ago that um, addresses issue of, uh, issues of uh, pluralism and uh, integration in society in Canada and, and around the world. And so the question of 
obviously representation in positions of power of um, uh, people who represent the diversity of our um, uh, population, ha according to the studies that we've done in our organization, are clearly uh, lead to better workplaces, more harmo not just more harmonious workplaces, but more productive, more efficient, more effective. And you know, even banks are, are, are starting to realize that that's true. And so obviously it's going to be true for our industry. And it's been true on the sets. I've, you know, uh, at least 50% of the movies that I've ever made have had either a woman director or a woman producer you know, that I work with. I, it, and I, so I see that in, in those places. I'm obviously privileged because I've worked on uh, with a great people who haven't yet been identified as being nasty. So, um, but I do think that uh, when the, you know, we talk about a trend, the, the significant trend is that, and, and, and uh, Catherine and Teresa both made reference to this, it, it's starting to cost money, big, big money. And I, you know, I hate for it to come down to that, but you know, given that we live in a you know, patriarchal you know, hegemony, it makes a difference. And to the extent that having a workplace that's not sensitive to issues of sexual harassment is going to cost serious money, that is a very important moment at which the entire structure is shifting. And we need to be part of the movement that keeps it shifting and doesn't let it uh, shrink back on itself. Thank you so much. Melanie, did you have anything? Well, I mean, I think gender parity is definitely part of the solution, but I don't think it's the be-all and end-all. I think it, it's 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 very it's a complex a complex sort of situation that we're in, and we do need that cultural shift. But it doesn't come solely from gender parity. I think things need to work in tandem, like including equal pay, accountability, and as well as consequences, like seeing real real life consequences to to behaviors that you know shouldn't be occurring. You know things that happen, men displaying themselves. Like there needs to be real life consequences, and and I think there needs to be this bit of a seismic shift in the way women are perceived and respected, because I think there is something broken there that's that's not quite working. Like Jimmy Kimmel recent or about a year ago, he did this streeter uh, sort of segment about where they asked children why they think women are not being paid the same amount as men for the same jobs, and it was very clear that even on that level of like these, you know four-year-olds, five-year-olds, both girls and boys view women very differently, you know, like we don't work hard enough, we're not smart enough, and, and so there needs to be a change from a very deep level, and I think also at the same time, like what comes along with gender parity is that once you have a seat at the table, we also need men and women who will proactively work towards change and not just like have that seat at the table and sit there and, you know, kind of like pat themselves on the back for being a part of it, but actively trying to make change and make it for everyone in the entire community, which is, I know, very ambitious and very lofty, but um, I don't know, maybe I'm still very idealistic in that way. <laughs> Hang on, though. I like it. Thank you so much. Catherine? There needs to be a cultural shift, and we won't achieve that unless we're all working together, and that includes uh, gender parity, and that's something that is very important to the Guild, and we've done a, a lot of work on that in the, in the last couple of years, and we are seeing changes in the numbers. We've seen, we're encouraging new membership in those areas. We need to, you know, the, the percentage of women directors in Canada is minuscule, but it's also a reflection of our membership. We need more members. We need more women directing in Canada, and that's um, it's not something that we can change on our own. We have to all work on that together. And um, the cultural shift that is happening um, in gender, I think, will only have m positive influences on the issues of harassment that we're dealing with now. Thank you so much. Tova? I'm so proud of ACTRA's uh, Toronto ACTRA Women's Committee talk and the toolkits they've been doing for the last six years to develop filmmakers who are women, working with whites and the women of whites. And I mean, it's just incredible advocacy and building those tools so we have those filmmakers. Um, we've done a lot on governance and leadership. We need women in positions of leadership. So I'm very, very proud that once we called this meeting, a number of women in positions of leadership called us to say, can we come to this meeting, including TIFF, including the Academy. Um, and, and we just like constantly saying, oh, we need to be there. We need to be there. Women who are now in positions of power. We just had an election at Actor Toronto, and I'm happy to say for the very first time, 17 out of our 24 leaders are now women. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, we've worked really hard to do that. 
And we've got the most diverse uh, council we've ever had as well. Diversity and gender equality. Uh, it's just a different conversation around the room when that happens. And one last tiny little thing is I'm also very, very proud, as we all were, um, that day when we got together, November 23rd, to have the Minister of Culture, Madame Jolie, the Minister of Employment, Patty, how do you say her name? Hadju? Hadju? And the Minister of Women, what's her name? Miriam? Status. Status of Women? All three ministers wrote us a letter jointly wishing us well on this huge effort that we were doing and promised to work with us after the fact. Premier Wynne sat beside me at a telefilm or, uh, event the other day and said, so you're talking about anti-harassment? Yes, we are, Premier. She goes, well, you know, you can't fire everybody. <laughs> um, now, but how do I stay involved? How can I help you? So we've got oh, a meeting great. with her next week that's and great. the Minister of Culture uh, also <laughs> wants to work <laughs> with us. can fire everybody. So it's... <laughs> You know, so Thank everybody's you. working together. That's what's inspiring to me, That's is wonderful. we're all going to do this. Thank you so much. Alex? I mean, I think what I would say is I see a real commitment from leadership in terms of what I'm seeing positively, that when you see that commitment from leadership to change the environment and to ensure that from the top down, this type of behavior is not acceptable, you really do see effective change within organizations. So really can really help galvanize a change in what is acceptable behavior. So Thank you. And Marguerite, bring us home. I think, no pressure. Uh, I think all of my colleagues on the panel have gone macro with this, and they've all talked about solutions, but you've asked us what gives you hope. And there is one teeny weeny little thing that gave me hope, one little glimmer, and I know it's not necessarily replicable, but it meant a lot to me. A friend of mine posted on Facebook that when this whole Me Too thing happened, she posted five men who are currently my Facebook friends were inappropriate with me. And then she said, after she posted that, two of them got in touch with her directly. And she had conversations with two of them about their behavior, about their relationship, about their friendship, and both left those conversations enriched. And that gives me so much hope. Oh, it's beautiful. Thank you so much. That's great. You did bring it home. Um, <laughs> so we have um, about 10, 15... 20 minutes for the Q&A, um, so I'll take as many questions as possible. Um, and I would urge the panelists, let's give brief answers so that we can at least address many questions and not dive too deep into one or two. Yeah, right here, thank you. That's a great question, I'll just, I'll just repeat it for everybody. So the question is, when you're, uh, when you're in school and you're being dealt with by your professors who are not necessarily adhering to the same code of conduct as the union, you don't know that the way they're treating you is incorrect because you're a young person and this is, your, this is new to you. Is there any, you've mentioned that there are some plans to go into the next generation. Um, can you talk about that please? So the Canadian Film Center, uh, George Brown, York University, uh, uh, Montreal Theatre School, National Theatre School, they've all contacted us already to say we want to be part of this process and we said that'll be the educational process, we'll get that group together, that's part of our third working group. So yes, we need to go into, absolutely, and it's a big part of the discussion of the women who've come forward talking about we've been abused by directors having us be more open, you know, having to be naked and pushing us to do extreme things that don't make you a better actor. So yes, absolutely has to be a focus. Great, and uh, you mentioned making the producers' uh, toolkits, like the, the webinars and stuff, making them public. Is that something that could also be shared with? Oh, absolutely, that's part of the plan. Um, you know, within the CMPA, we have a, a strategy for dealing with harassment that it has four components to it. And the fourth component is absolutely reaching out to the next generation, because again, what we're focused on is a cultural shift. Um, we can't solve everything immediately, we know this. What really struck me at the very beginning in your opening remarks, the date October 4th. And I think, Catherine, to your point, you said like the meeting we, ha we all had was, what was it, like uh, six months ago or something? It feels like this is happening in dog years. Like yeah. it's happening so fast. Um, and so we're making a lot of progress very, very quickly. Um, so by saying it's the fourth priority, I'm by no means saying, I don't know when it's gonna happen. We're developing the tools that we're gonna share right away. And sure, we, and we're actually talking about starting delivery on those tools in the new year. Oh, wow. Um, so uh, they're going to be available on our website and all of that, but that's not enough. That's very passive. So we will be reaching out actively because we recognize that it's, 
it's reaching out to, to the next generation that is going to make the cultural shift really permeate. That's very important to us. And I would actually urge anybody in this room who is currently in theater school or in film school or who's an alumnus of a program where you think that that kind of information and that kind of education would be helpful, maybe you can even proactively make sure that your school gets on the list to be on the distribution list for this information in case you go to a school that's not on that list. Yeah, thank you. Oh my goodness. Your courage let will me pay just off. Let Your me courage will pay off. Your courage will pay off. Let me just repeat the question Hang for people on who to didn't it. hear it. So the question is, if you are a woman who's hoping to help spearhead this change, one of the side effects of that, this happens a lot with, I think, different marginalized identities as well. If you're constantly trying to sort of say, hey, our culture has these problems, it makes you unlikable. You are socially penalized for telling, for speaking yeah. truth to the powers that be. Any advice for people who are in that role, who are, you know, who are hoping to move into leadership positions, but along the way might be putting some feathers up. I think first off, you the whole notion of being likable, we have to get that. We have to get rid of that. We really, really do because, you know what, I've been a shit disturber all my life and <laughs> I'm gonna probably continue to be so, but you know, it's one of the reasons why like obviously I'm here on this panel is because I have opinions that haven't always been the popular opinion. But at the same time, I feel like I have to fight for what's right. And and if you feel like being in a leader leadership position is where you want to be, you have to kind of ignore the naysayers. And if there's reprisals, then obviously we know that there are certain things that are happening that will help you, that will support you through that. You know, so try not to be afraid. I know again, it's very lofty. I guess I've put myself here as the very idealistic person, <laughs> but you know, you in a way you just have to push through it because. I had a very difficult uh, university experience. You know, I was I was, you know, one of very few people of color as well as women. I went to film school. You know, it was it was a very sort of isolating experience. I've also worked in salaried positions where, you know, you work towards something more, but there's not a lot of people who support you behind it. But in in a weird way, you have to dig deep and just try and push through, no matter how many days you have that just tell you you should give up. Short-term pain for long-term gain. You really will. It, it, courage and speaking truth, defending people who don't have uh, power, that is, you're always on the right side with that. I think what is uniquely challenging in your position, and I've been in your position, so, I, I, and when I was in your position, I asked my father for advice because he, he was a very, very good businessman and I figured he'd, he'd be able to relate. And I said, you know, Daddy, what do you, what do, you do in a situation like that? And he said, Bucky, I've never even heard about a situation like that. Like he was <laughs> zero help. Um, <laughs> what a moving Love story. You, Daddy. <laughs> oh, I know. <laughs> he had other strengths. Anyway. <laughs> anyway. Um, when I look back on it now, see, the thing is, I think if you're going from job to job to job to job, totally different dynamic, you're in a salaried position. And that's the, the nexus of your challenge. And the thing, looking back, the thing I wish I'd done, I wish I'd found a champion. I wish I'd found one person, male or female, who I could talk to, who would understand the issue, understand what I was dealing with, and who could help me deal with it in a constructive way internally. And if your company is small and that champion doesn't exist, then I would say maybe what you do is you try to formalize how you address this issue. Not in terms of anything litigious or anything like that, but formalize time for a conversation with a, a superior about exactly what you're experiencing, what you feel the impacts are for you and for the company and for the other employees. Try to formalize it. That would be my advice and good luck. It sucks. <laughs> Thank you. Yep, right here. Thank you. That's actually a really valuable point. Thank you for bringing that up. So the question was, um, there are a lot of people that are sort of um, within our industry but that are not represented in a way that is gives them easy access to a conversation like this. So either they're marginalized in terms of not of being sort of cash poor that they can't necessarily make it to a $25 breakfast or they're in an industry um, like documentary where they're not under a union where they're invited to conversations. So the question is, is there a way to open up these industry leader conversations so that people who are in a little bit of a more marginalized position are able to gain access and are able to have their voices heard and to tell their stories? Is there any way you can make that open? So I just want to say two things. I hear you. Um, I want to thank, for instance, Sarah Paula years ago, because when we were creating 
um, uh, policies for children working in the industry, we started with the unionized kids, right? Creating working conditions and protections and all of that, and Sarah was a big part of that. <laughs> Always thank her for that. But then, years later, it took us 10 years, and that answers your, you know, to, to never give up. It took us 10 years, but we actually got legislation passed to protect all kids in the industry, whether it's unionized or not. So that leads me to the point that the good unions just do that. You know, we do the goddess's work. We do this for everyone. <laughs> and so I've been at ACTRA taking calls from, as I said earlier, everyone. And we've got a new director of research who is a statistician who is talking about documenting and, and actually getting the metrics that we were talking about earlier. And so that we know where we sit, not just in the unionized work, but in the industry as a whole. So I encourage you to keep calling and finding the right union that will listen and, and be part of that conversation. The actual meeting we had was just the beginning because we needed action. And you know we can't invite 15,000 of my members to come into a room. So it was the leaders, I represent my 15,000, the leaders to actually get an action plan plan started. There will be more open forums. And I hear you about they can't be just $25 tickets as well. I hear you. And, and we'll put that into the mix. We absolutely will. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. True. And, and uh, we would certainly want to take the position that all of filmmakers are welcome um, to the guild. What's the doc the organization guild? called for her? Just doc. Doc. So anybody here who works in documentary, look documentary up. organization of Canada. Thank you. Factual lifestyle to some degree fits under Canadian Media Guild in certain situations. But yeah, you're right. There are a lot of people. I think I think that might be something um, maybe even that we can bring up with organizations like TIFF to say for for gatherings like this. Is there a way that a portion of tickets can be made on a sliding scale, um, just to open the doors a little bit wider so that a broader section of the population can be brought in? I just want to say that TNG, when I called them, dif made a differentiation between a staff member and a crew actor, and we have lots of those. CMG, so just to repeat that for everybody, CMG has a differentiation between staff members and freelancers, and freelancers has less rights. Um, how interesting. I feel that all human rights should be equal. Um, Thanks for bringing that up. I think you've raised some really good concerns. I, I, I don't know that there's necessarily going to be a forum where you're going to be given a microphone to speak, but I, I really urge you to put these concerns in writing and to send them to people because I think that's one way to have your voice heard. And know that I have. I'm sure you have. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, right here. So just for anyone who couldn't hear that, this is Jill Golick. She's the, the president of the Writers Guild of Canada. Thank you so much. Uh, and her suggestion is that the more women's stories we are able to get onto our screens, the more people will cease to be surprised at what women's lives are like. Um, and <laughs> and the, like, it's, it's sort of alarming to think that if 4% if of the um, you know, people who control the story are women, the 96% of the creations, the female creations that are on screen are by men. Yeah. Yeah. Men made those women. And then we're, and all my, my daughters and every young girls are going, oh, that's what women are like. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. So it's not safe to assume that, you know, all women are feminists either, right? It's because all, we're, we're fed a kind of a presentation of ourselves that is created by people who are not us. They've only seen those creations, and yeah. those creations are saying, come here, all the time. Yeah, this happens with minority communities, too, right? I feel like sometimes when I look at TV and I see black people, I'm like, did you, do you know any black people? Or did you just, <laughs> did you write that based on, like, an American black person that you saw on an American television show? Like, you're writing a caricature of a caricature. It's like a photocopy that's been made 25 times, and it's starting to degrade. <laughs> You know what I mean? I feel like there there are such um, stereotypes that are being told that women behave like this and people of color behave like this and gay people behave like this and trans people are like this and it's we have these like straight men playing trans women and they're imagining what that's like when we could maybe hire a trans woman and let her show us what that's like from her own lived experience. Um, just saying. So thank you, Jill, for raising that because I really think that the more authenticity that we have in the voices that we privilege on stage, the more or on screen rather. Um, the more that we're able to sort of broaden our understanding of humanity and stop seeing other groups of people as these mysterious, oblique, confusing, <laughs> what could women want? I don't know, listen and they'll tell you. Um, <laughs> right here. Uh, hello, my name's Carla DeYoung. I'm head of production at Piggy Ship Entertainment. We're a children's television live action production company. 
publishing company. You do such good work. Thank you. So good. <laughs> um, and, you know, our company is run by three men. Um, and I just wanted to talk, Martin, I just wanted some clarity on a point that I thought I heard you say that in your company you haven't had a sexual harassment complaint in 30 years. Is that correct? No, not in my company, but in, uh, I've been in the industry for 30 years. I, I haven't, I, and I've made a few dozen films. I haven't had a complaint of sexual harassment on, to me, on my sets, or on my sets that I know of. Right, okay. I'm not, I'm okay. not I in, for a second, saying it hasn't been happening. Sure. I'm, I understand. Um, I just want to say that I work in children's television, and in the last 12 months, I have had complaints ranging from a vexatious comment to a full-out arrest. Mm. on my set in children's television. Mm. So I find it really hard when I hear that to, to, to believe that it's not going on every single person's set. And as someone very high up in my company, it is my job. And all of us producers and owners of production companies and heads of production to look at how we are working and our reporting lines to make sure that we find out. Because it is not good enough for anyone to say, I didn't hear it, I didn't hear about it, I'm sorry, it isn't. I have to go and find those people and I have to go and find those lines of communication because every day I learn about things that have happened on my set in the last three years that I've worked there that people have not felt comfortable coming forward. And to, your, to some of the points that I've heard today, I'm so happy to hear the point, um, Teresa, about the anonymous phone line. I'm getting that from my company. My company will have a phone line that any of my people from all of your organizations can call to report my company to me and to anyone else that they want to because it's not acceptable. You know, I, I take this very seriously and I'm right up there with all of this. This has been one of the best sessions I've ever been to. But, you know, Christmas party season is upon us. Yesterday our company sent out a brand new harassment policy. Every single person working on our sets, including DGC members, ACTRA members, CMP, everything, will be doing training before the end of this year on my show, Working With Children. Yes. Thank you. Just in case anyone at the back wasn't able to hear everything that Good Carla voice. said. It was very well projected, but just in case, for accessibility's sake, I will say, so she works with a company called Sinking Ship, which makes really high quality, quite high quality children's television. She's saying that even on a wholesome children's show, and it is a very wholesome children's show, I've been on it myself, uh, she's had sexual assaults, even leading up to the point of an arrest on a show working with children. So she's now implementing a hotline that anybody is welcome to call to lodge complaints against members of her company. That to me is a really strong commitment that that's you're taking to protect the people on your set. So thank you for being a leader in that. I would actually really encourage you, I, I don't know if this is out of place, but um, to write an article about this and get this published because I want more people to know that you're doing that because that's fantastic. I've worked for Sinking Ship and you guys are fantastic. Um, so hearing that that level of, of, um, of care is actually happening at all levels of the leadership and that that level of um, potential vulnerability because you open yourself up to stuff, right? If you're saying, okay, tell me if there's a problem, you're gonna hear if there's problems. Um, that's a really courageous thing to do in, for, in a leadership role. So thank you for being a leader in that. Please make sure everyone knows you're doing that. I will. And if I could just say one thing, these, just because I'm a woman, it is not because I'm a woman that's the head of production that I find out about this. Because all of my line producers, or right now, my line producers, production managers on that particular show and other shows are actually men. So the people who bring these comments up to me are actually men right. in those roles. But so just so it's not like, oh, well, she's a woman. So, you know, people further down the food chain will feel more comfortable going to her. No, no, no. It's not about that. It has to be at every single level. Thank you so much. And Thanks. can I also say thank you to Stinking Ship for your commitment to engaging female filmmakers. Yep. Sinking Ship has a show called um, Androids, and the lead on that show is, like, what is she, 14 years old now? And I just saw... Uh, She's 18 now. Oh, God, don't say that. Um, <laughs> but I just saw that she, they, they've, she's now on set apprenticing to be a director, which, you know, you take your child actor and you apprentice them. Um, it's, it's beautiful, so thank you. Um, we are really almost out of time for this q and I can take one more question. Who's got the big question that's going to make it all question. feel worthwhile? Sarah, Sarah Polly, please. Um, I guess I just wanted to weigh in that conversation because, you know, when Marty... Can I give you a mic, actually? I think you might want to do it. Oh, I'm going to fall off the stage. Can someone hear mic? Thank you. I used to be an actor, I can project. Um, <laughs> um, I, I guess I just want to weigh in, you know, when Marty said, you know, he hasn't had someone come to him about this in 30 years, that didn't surprise me and it didn't make me feel that you were willfully blind or ignorant, which I think, it, I, I'm not, I know that's not what you're saying, but I feel like there is a sense of 
not being able to believe that to be true. The truth is, we are, we've all, most of us, I think there are probably a few notable brave exceptions in this room, we have all been complicit in this yes. culture. Yes. We've all seen things, we've let them slide. We would have never gone to a producer to report it because no one would have cared, right? That was the culture, we were all used to it. So I feel like it's really important moment to acknowledge a huge shift that I think is happening in our industry that I'm most excited about is I think that complicity is changing. I think now you will hear complaints where no one was gonna bring them to you before. Um, and I think that's really exciting. It doesn't surprise me these things have happened in children's entertainment at all, actually. Um, and I just want to say also that the only people in my life, in my experience in this industry who, the industry who have intervened, have been crew. They've been drivers, they've been grips, they've been electrics, and they've lost their jobs for doing so. Wow. Um, so I think a lot of what we can do in these more visible parts of the film industry is to embolden and give those people, even if it's the beginning of every shoot day, the license to intervene if you see an injustice. If there are children on a set, you are all their parents. It's up to you because their parents probably won't do it. You know, if, if you see someone being harassed, whether they be male or female, that you have the license to intervene, you will not lose your job. Because they tend to be, sadly, the people with the most courage, maybe they're seeing more. Um, but I think that making sure that that message from these positions of leadership to the crew is very, very clear. You have permission to intervene, please do so you won't lose your job, you won't be fired. And for us all to examine our own complicity in the past and not all pretend that we've been great this whole time and suddenly like, you know, people are acknowledging our good behavior. We're all learning good behavior now. And that's, I think, a really positive thing. Sarah, thank you so much. Thank you. So that's the extent of the time that we have for this panel. Um, I'm really impressed and really grateful with the quality of this discourse. Thank you all so much, panelists. Audience, thank you for your excellent questions and your attention and your, your, your care in being here in this room today. Um, we, have about ha we have like half an hour left to mingle back out in the hallway where the breakfast is, but I'm going to ask for two more minutes of your attention before we leave this room because I want to quickly introduce you to some people in the audience who you might also wish to speak with before um, when we're back out there. So friends, if I introduce you, if you can turn around and wave so that people can spot you and put a, put a face to the name. Um, from the Writers Guild of Canada, we have Jill Golick, the president. We met her before. I believe the strategy director, Natalia Escobar Bajorquez, is also here. Thank you so much. Uh, and from TIFF, are there some people from TIFF in the room at the moment? Yeah. Michelle Mejia, uh, TIFF COO, is right here. Thank you so much. Anybody else? Maxine and Maxine Bailey, thank you. Hi, Max. Thank you so much. So if you have anything that you want to bring up, sorry? From the National Film Board of Canada, we've just seen and David there in the middle. Thank you so much. So if you have anything to table with those people. And the person who was with Doc also, where did that person go? Jennifer. Jennifer? <laughs> Thank you. Um, so if you need to speak to those people, now you can find them. Um, and I would love you to join me in thanking our wonderful panelists. <laughs> Martin Cates, Patricia Rosema, Melanie Chung, Catherine Middleton, Teresa Tova, Alex Herber, and Marguerite Piggott. Thank you so much. Thank you. And now I'd like to hand the proceedings back to Kathleen Drum, TIFF's Director of Industry. And Kathleen, also, we need to owe a huge thank you to you. Kathleen was the, the gentle juggernaut who put all of this together <laughs> and, had, and had such care and thoughtfulness in, in assembling this. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Nicole. And um, you know, I really do want to thank Nicole, who has been an extraordinary creative collaborator on pulling all this together and bringing shape to the conversation and um, setting the tone and making it a really useful constructive conversation. So thank you so much, Nicole. You've done an amazing job. And I, I just want to uh, tell you about our next breakfast at TIFF, where we consider uh, the curatorial responsibility of programming ethics in light of all of the things that we've talked about today. What are um, festival programmers' uh, responsibilities um, film critics' responsibilities and broadcasters in terms of giving a platform to films by people who have um, shown questionable behaviour in the industry. So I think that's going to be a fascinating conversation and that will be on Friday, January the 12th. So we are now... We have breakfast. I, I mentioned Anna before. Okay, okay. Anna, Anna we, we, we're handing out the um, information about free advice for people in Toronto if somebody has been a victim of, of sexual assault or harassment. And, and Anna Mattis provided us with that information. She's here today. 
So we have, um, we have breakfast available for another half an hour. Please come and join us. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you.